Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual conversations. I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art, and we are delighted to have you with us this morning. Railroads connect us, and at this time, when distance feels farther than ever, we are celebrating those connections. We are so grateful to connect with you right here at Virtual Conversations, the Center for Railroad Photography and Art's first ever conference. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. With a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. We have a big crowd today, and that delights us. But there are just a few of us working behind the scenes. So if you're having any technical difficulties, please be patient. We are recording all of the presentations today, and we will post them on our YouTube channel for later viewing. With so many attendees, only our presenters will be on camera today, and everyone's microphone is muted by default. We would love to take your questions, though. Please send them to us using the chat or the Q&A features, which are located in the lower right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. We will take as many questions as we can after each presentation, and we can take more during the big Q&A session at the end of the day. Also note that you have several options to customize your view of the presentations. Look for the round icons in the upper right-hand corner of the presentation window and click through them to find the view that works best for you. Okay, bear with me one moment. I'm gonna to need to share my screen again. So, in a normal year, we'd be here at Lake Forest College for our annual Conversations Conference. And while this year feels a world apart from any other year, some things have not changed. Like the weather, which is as bad as ever in Lake Forest for our conference weekend. This was yesterday morning, taken by our board member, Norm Carlson, Although today is actually supposed to be pretty nice, naturally. It's uh, actually sunny and clear in Madison, although a little cool. When we made the decision to cancel our in-person conference, we knew we had to try something online. We put together virtual conversations in just five weeks, and the response has been incredible and truly heartening for all of us at the center. More than 700 of you have registered for this event. 14 volunteers rose to this unprecedented occasion to put together 11 presentations for online delivery. We will see seven of them today. The other four are already available for viewing on our YouTube channel. They are A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to CRPA, A Wonderful Travel Log by Oren Helbach and George Hyotis, Mikado's Farewell, China's Last Steam Railroad by Travis DeWitz and Todd Halamka, featuring the Chinese JS steam locomotives at the Sandelling Coal Mine in Northwestern China. Beautiful Fragility, a Railroad Cinematography in the Pacific Northwest by Cameron Suttlemeyer, featuring his wonderful videos of the Branch Line and Short Line Railroads of the Pacific Northwest. And there's also my own show, Return to Copper Country, Rediscovering the Railroads of Clifton and Marinci, Arizona. We extend our great thanks to our presenters for sharing your time and talents with us. We likewise offer special recognition to everyone who is financially supporting today's conference as patron sponsors. Your gifts helped us to pivot, innovate, and make this opportunity possible at no cost to more than 700 individuals who have registered, both members and new friends. For your generosity and confidence in our work, we cannot thank you enough. I have to say something extra about one of these people, and that's Ken Rehor. Virtual Conversations is happening in large part because of Ken, and we owe him not only our gratitude, but also free drinks for life. Ken will also be presenting today, and I'll tell you more about him when I introduce him later this afternoon. Thank you, Ken. Our Board of Directors at the Center helps make possible everything we do. These people give selflessly, selflessly to advance our mission of preserving and presenting significant images of railroading. 
we have a phenomenal board at the center. And to each of you, thank you. Our staff has been working mostly from home since March 17th. And thanks to their efforts, we have not missed a beat. Haley Page deserves a special shout out this morning for her tireless efforts in preparing for today's events. One of our great strengths at the center is our adaptability. And in the past month, we have pivoted to sharing more of our work online. In addition to this virtual conference, we have increased our schedule of social media posts while adding more albums from our collections. Adrian is going to tell you more about those and you can browse them by going to the collections tab on our website, railphoto-art.org. You can also get to all of our social media channels by clicking on those buttons at the upper right. The YouTube one is the red button. From there, you can view all of our presentations from today's conference. Another way we're celebrating connections is through our annual awards program, named for our founder, John Edward Gruber. The details are available on our website under the awards tab, and the deadline for submissions is May 1st. Entries are open to all, and we would love to see work from each one of you. Make our judges' jobs difficult, please. Member support enables everything we do at the center. If you are not a member yet, we are so glad you're here, and we would be delighted for you to join us, which you can also do on our website under the Support and Join tab at the upper right. One of the benefits of membership is our quarterly journal, Railroad Heritage, and you can expect the next issue to hit your mailbox right around June 1st. We also publish books, drawing upon the depth of our ever-expanding archives. Later this morning, Kevin Keefe and Fred Fraley will tell you about our newest book, The Railroad Photography of J. Parker Lamb. We also plan to publish another book this fall, and I am announcing it here for the first time publicly, The Railroad Photography of Donald W. Furler, featuring his stunning black and white action shots of steam railroading in the Northeast from the 1930s to the 1950s. Don found the 4x5 speed graphic a little too small for his liking and upgraded to a 5x7 speed graphic camera. His negatives have stunning resolution and clarity and he shows us a world of steam railroading in the Northeast that I never got to experience, but have found absolutely fascinating looking through his work. You will not want to miss this book. Don's son, Alan, is with us today on the conference. And Alan, we cannot thank you enough for your confidence in our work and your assistance with your father's incredible photography. We are so happy to be bringing this book to press and look forward to getting it published this fall. Look for that around September. And with that, a little ahead of schedule, actually, I will introduce our first presenter, Adrian Evans, our archivist at the center. Adrian hails from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and she received her master's degree in 2014 from the University of Wisconsin's School of Library Information Studies. That's how I first met her, when she reached out to me to do an informational interview with the center. Adrian spent one year at the Image Permanence Institute in Rochester, New York, and then two years at History Colorado in Denver before joining us at the center in 2017. She brings great knowledge and passion to the preservation of photographs and other visual materials, and both of those have been invaluable time and again as we have experienced expansive growth for our archives at the center, including finding an all-new storage facility last year, a search which Adrian led very successfully. So I'll now turn the uh, presenter screen over to Adrian, and uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the archives that we have at the center, uh, what has come into our care recently, and where the growth is going in the future. Uh, so Adrian, uh, let me stop sharing and turn this over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. So I'm waiting on my shared content screen. I've still got it grayed out, Scott. Okay, uh, let me see. How about now? All right, I'm good to go. Hi, 
All right, can everyone see the collections update screen? Hello? Yes, looks good. Okay, cool. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Adrian Evans. I'm the archivist at the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. My job at the center is to oversee the preservation, processing, and digitization of our holdings, provide access to the collections via online galleries and reference, and promote our collections on social media. So speaking of collections, we currently hold over 300,000 images in our permanent collections, the majority of which are digitized. Photographers and artists represented in our holdings include the very well-known, such as Jim Shaughnessy and Ted Rose, as well as vernacular photographers and talented hobbyists, such as Fred Springer and Leo King. Um, a complete list can be found on our website. So prior to the pandemic, the biggest story with collections in the past few years has been the dramatic growth of our holdings. It's exciting, uh, but it's also going to affect the organization a lot in upcoming years as we strive to find appropriate storage for our materials, ways to better track and manage our collections and additional staffing to support the timely processing of new acquisitions. Uh, today, I'm going to give you kind of the 30,000 foot view of collection growth in the last few years, just so we can appreciate kind of how dramatic it's been. So as you can see, the center's permanent holdings have grown considerably in the last 10 years. We started out with a mere 48,000 images in the Railroad Heritage Visual Archive in 2010, but now counting our current holdings plus commitments we've made to future donors, I'm projecting that we'll be at a little over 67,000 images in the years following 2020. For now, we're sitting at a comfortable 300,000, but are scheduled to take in at least 60,000 more images by the end of this year. Uh, growth is great, and it represents the hard work of our Collections and Acquisitions Committee, as well as the trust that the railroad photography community places in the center. However, when I put this graph together last year, it really drove home the fact that we would have to up our game in several respects to accommodate our continually growing archive. And I'm happy to say that uh, this year we've pretty much done just that, 2019 to 20. 20 has been an eventful and largely successful year for our, our collection staff as well as the organization as a whole. First last spring, we were awarded a five-year grant from the Elizabeth Morris Charitable, Charitable Trust to dedicate to improving our preservation practices and providing greater access to our collections. Included in this grant were plans for a larger work in archival space, a collections management system with a digital collections portal, and additional staffing to catalog and process our growing archive. These funds combined with your support um, have enabled us to accomplish a lot already. Um, as you can see here from us uh, flourishing in our new archive space, in late October of 2019, we relocated our collections to this storage space. Uh, this is three suites comprised of about 1400 square feet of storage. This new space also includes climate control, 24-7 building security and monitoring, and a fire suppression system. This is a huge step up from our previous location. In addition, uh, we moved our staff and administrative offices to a new location in January. Uh, this working environment has afforded all of our staff some much needed space for their own endeavors, uh, with specific rooms dedicated to archival processing and exhibits prep. And finally, we've also been able to take on additional help now that we have a lot more space. Uh, UW SLIS students Angel Tang and Wesley Sondheim joined our team as interns in March. You can see their beautiful pictures on here. Um, so we were trucking along pretty well, and then the pandemic hit. Um, as much as possible, CRPA staff have tried to carry on as normal since Governor Tony Evers declared an emergency safer at home order in Wisconsin on March 23rd. What this has meant in practical terms is that our staff can't access and work on our collections materials as we typically would. Instead, we're spending more time posting digitized images to Flickr and our website, as well as working on research projects. Uh, we've been fortunate as an organization that we can do so much of this work remotely and that working from home hasn't hampered our efforts to engage with our community and provide access to our materials. And this has also meant, as you can see here, that we've had a lot more time for WebEx meetings and check-ins, which has its own joys and uh, challenges. To continue processing collections. 
So we've had some ups and downs this year, but let me tell you a bit about what we've already accomplished with our collections work and what we're hoping to do next. So uh, we started digitizing the Victor Hand collection in June of 2018. And as of January, uh, we're celebrating the completion of digitizing the approximately 46,000 negatives in the collection. It's been a very enriching experience. Uh, the collection documents rail operations in over 50 countries and on five continents. And working with Victor has been extremely educational for both myself and our archives assistant, Natalie, who should get credit for digitizing pretty much this entire collection. Um, we're currently working to perfect the descriptive metadata. And this image is from uh, the latest batch of Victor's negatives to arrive at the center. Uh, this image shows uh, Guayaquil and Quito steam operations on the Devil's Nose in Ecuador in, on July 11th of 1996. And just another image from Victor's collection. Um, this one shows a, a Grand Trunk Western Steam Locomotive number 6319 in Pontiac, Michigan on February 21st, 1960. So Natalie now is currently working to get more of Victor's work up on Flickr, and you should expect to see selections from Poland, Russia, and France in the coming weeks. So next, let me talk about um, our big current project, the Jim Shaughnessy Collection. Um, we kicked off digitizing the collection uh, with Shaughnessy's historic glass plates earlier this spring. Dating from the late 19th to early 20th centuries, most of these glass plates depict Delaware and Hudson operations, and some even appeared in Shaughnessy's own publication on the B&H, uh, published in 1967. These plate sizes range from 4 by 5 to 8 by 10 inch, and um, the larger ones have particularly remarkable resolution. Several of the plates feature the areas around the B&H owned resort hotels in New York State, the Champlain Hotel in Bluff Point, New York, and the Fort William Henry Hotel in Lake George. There's also coverage of the Lake George Lake steamers. Um, this steamboat company was apparently also owned by the DNH. This particular image uh, shows a view of the afternoon DNH train with the steamboat Horicon visible at the right. And this was shot in Lake George uh, circa 1912. Um, this gem from the glass plates shows a view of uh, the Albany Station, which was taken from a vantage point on the New York Central Bridge. b &H trains from north and south are visible on the lower level, while New York Central platforms are visible on the upper level to the left. And finally, a personal favorite from the glass plates. This features the steam yacht called the Allied, riding a flat car down a makeshift launching track at the steamboat dock at Baldwin. This was near the northern end of Lake George. This photograph is attributed to Fred Thatcher and we've given it a circa date of 1890. Thus far, we've digitized 217 glass plates. Many arrived without descriptive metadata, so we're still putting together the pieces regarding the dates and locations of these images. One of our interns is currently working on a Flickr album to showcase the glass plates, and we hope to have it up a little later this month we look forward to you all viewing it and giving us some assistance with the identification. So now on to new accessions. The first new accession I'd like to announce is the donation of the David Maney collection. David has been photographing locomotives since his youth in the late 1940s, but counts the 50s when he shot with Donald W. Furler and Bob Collins as one of his most formative periods. Also, David was employed in the Baltimore and Ohio's technical trainings program, which enabled him to travel and photograph throughout the B&O system. Comprised of approximately 19,000 images, the David Maney Collection documents rail operations in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic United States, with some coverage of the Midwest, South, and Canada. And David was in the process of sending his first batch of negatives for permanent retention at the center when the pandemic occurred. We look forward to starting this work up again when all of this is over. Um, and this particular image shows a young woman with two children uh, at Union Station in Washington, D.C. in 1958. Another image from David. Um, this is a Baltimore and Ohio Railroad engineer, William Logan, on a fueling stop at Warwick, Ohio. This was shot in 1957. And finally from David, um, 
This is a Baltimore and Ohio railroad worker cleaning up diesel parts at Glenwood, Pennsylvania in December of 1956. So another new accession I'd like to talk about is the Ron Hill collection. Uh, Ron Hill's from Colorado and formerly served as the president and a trustee of the Colorado Railroad Museum, an organization he was affiliated with for 42 years. Um, all the railroads of the Intermountain West over the past 60 years in color and black and white. And between 1975 and 2007, he produced 11 books of his railroad photography. The collection, which contains approximately 2,000 black and white negatives and 2,400 color slides, um, will arrive at, um, has partially has arrived at the center already. A CRPA board member, Jeff Browse, was kind enough to help Hill pack slides and transport them to our office here in Madison. They arrived slightly before the pandemic. And this image shows a Colorado and Southern Railway freight train in Leadville, Colorado in 1961. Another image from Ron, uh, this is a Canadian Pacific Railway train near Sink Lake, British Columbia on February 27, 1979. And finally, here's a Union Pacific freight train headed eastward on Sullivan's Curve. Um, this was shot in 1967. And that pretty much wraps up all the collections news for today. Later on today, and please follow us on social media. We're super active and we really appreciate the support. Thank you.